right on what you're willing to, you know, sell your rights for on a set DRP or even on your customer payroll, right? So you, we can we can we can get to a consensus on that. Can we can we get to a consensus on what parts are damaged with all the knowledge that's in this room right here? Absolutely, we can, right? We can all look at that to figure out what part is damaged. Can we look at the car and determine what's prior and what's accident related? Totally agree, we can. Yes. Repair versus replace? Yes. Agree, right? How about judgment time? Can we agree on judgment time? I would have to say no. And here's why, right? It's not that in, in this room, um, we might all be a little higher, right? But my guess is, again, if I had this damaged car that I'm going to show you, and I asked you to go put time on it for judgment, my guess is I'm going to have a different result from you guys and gals, right? And some of that's your technician's influence, and some of that's our own skill level, or whatever it might be, or our own thought process. But, but getting to a consensus on judgment time is hard. And the reason why it's hard, quite honestly, is we don't really have a consistent method. Would you agree in this industry on how we get to judgment time? Our, our methodology is, is a lot of times, is our, my technician told me it needed five hours on this, right? It happens. And that's not really a good method, so we'll talk about some things. Hey, Phil. Oh. Lovely. So how about parts usage? I think we can agree on parts usage. We may not agree with what parts are being used necessarily to fix a car, but we can agree on the usage, right? We made a decision, right, if you're DRP to get on that program. And oh, I, the insured who bought that insurance also made a decision that they're going to be okay with the policy that they signed we know they probably never read it, right? But the point is, is that, that stuff's all determined up front. So yeah, we can agree on it. What about P-Page or additional operations? Can we agree on that? Or let me add to that sentence that's not there. Can we agree on OEM procedures and P-Page uh, operations? I think, here's, I'm on the fence on that one. I think we in this room could agree on it. Do the insurance companies always agree with you every time you bring up a procedure that's supposed to be done on a car? No. Okay. No. No. Is it getting a little better though? Yeah. I mean, I hear across the country that it is, right? Uh, they're starting to pay for more things. You know, back in my day, we didn't get paid for feather, prime, and block, but it's pretty common to get paid for that now, right? I don't have anybody tell me that there's pushback on that, right? Feather, prime, and block is not a it's not an included operation. It says it in your database, right? Um, so, but other things like scanning, pre and post scanning, and all those kind of things, where when it first came out about a year ago, there was a lot of pushback, but now I'm hearing that they're paying for it a lot more. Of course, we have to be doing it. We have to be asking for it, right? Um, they're not going to just arbitrarily give it to you. Right? So, kind of on the fence on, on the P pages, it's, it's, it's Depends on the person that you get sometimes, right? All right, let's do approach and then we'll, uh, I'll let y'all stretch your legs and call the shop. Uh, yeah, it's your, your normal film, you know, it's coming in just in time. Hey, did you sign up for this thing? Okay, find your name on there. All right, so. Let's talk about, if I missed anything in the book that anybody wanted to, uh, you know, like, hey, you skipped this, you know, let's talk about it. Nothing yet? Okay. Um, so let's talk about walking the vehicle. Look, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, quite honestly, I'm a firm believer that you ought to have a defined disassembly process and a defined spot, so I know I'm going to ruffle feathers, quite honestly, with this. He knows my thought process. Um, I don't think cars should be getting disassembled all over your shop in multiple stalls. I think it's too hard to manage. I think it should be a defined area where it all takes place. Um, and we should have all the necessary tools and a lift and measuring systems and everything we need in that said area to get the result that we need, right? But as much as I believe that, most shops don't run that way. We still run traditionally, right? Kind of what I just told you earlier, the strategy at home, which by the way is, you know, you just get different results when you have a strategy at home. But if you're still gonna approach it that way, um, there are things you can do to make your life a little bit better. And I think quite honestly, technology has helped some of this stuff. 
But if we're going to go out, we're going to take our uh, file, right, and go make chicken scratch notes on the back of it so we can then come back into the office and write the estimate, right, because that's what we do. Um, so things that you need to, if you do things consistently, one thing's for sure, you'll stop yourself from walking back out to the car again, right? So for those of you that have been in this business as long as me, um, when we were using Polaroid cameras and they were bouncing off your chest when you were walking out there to use it, or even when we got to the point where we actually had a digital camera that we shared amongst the office, right? There was a point in time where we would walk out to the car, we would start to gather our information, right, Phil? And then we would make our notes and take our Polaroid pictures and we'd shake them, right? And then we would walk back into the shop and we'd staple them to the file. And then we'd be like, all right, I've got to write this thing. You know, Damn it, I didn't get the bin, right? And then we'd walk back out and go get the bin. I think some of that stuff has kind of gone away now that we use our phones. As we go out to cars, phones will decode bins now, right? And things of that nature. But my point of this battle is, is that when you go out to look at the car, if you want to get a consistent result where you don't end up back in your office and saying, oh, I need to go get the paint coat, or oh, I forgot the mileage, or the license plate, or whatever it is, have a consistent approach of how you gather the estimate, or you gather the information, right? Just gather it the same way every single time, right? Whatever it is you start with, get the VIN, and the license, and the miles, and the production date, right? And if you do it the same way every time, and you're consistent about how you do it, then you'll put less miles on your tennis shoes as you're walking back out there to relook at stuff, right? Simple thing, but and most of us in this room probably do that. Um, the other thing that comes up in, the, in, in this area, right, is it's kind of corny, but let the vehicle talk to you, right? So those of us who've been doing it a while, well, really what we mean by that is to go look at the car, look at before it gets taken apart, right? And I know most of us in this room have been doing it a while do this. Look at the gaps, right? You look at the damage, you look at the gaps. It's giving you um, a little bit of an indication on what's moved underneath, right? And then it just, that in itself isn't going to necessarily get us a better estimate. It's just going to tell us that we need to look deeper, right? So if you take the time to make sure you check those things out, um, you'll get a better result, right? And we'll talk about some of those visual indicators a little bit later in the class, right? So, um, direct and indirect or identifying damage. Um, direct is caused by the impact, right? Everybody pretty in tune with direct and indirect, right? Direct is caused by the damage. Indirect is not caused by the damage. The example I gave is here's the wreck and then here's some crap people left in their trunk that went flying around and the wreck happened. That would be indirect damage, right? whatever damage it was, okay? Um, visual indicators of direct damage, we'll just start talking about a little bit, is gaps, right? Those of us who've been doing this a long time, if the car is hit in the rear or even in the front, the first thing we start doing, right, is look at the deck lid gap to the quarter or if we're on the front of the car, look at the fenders, right, and see if we feel like anything's new. Um, buckles and roofs are a visual indicator of direct damage. Um, crack seam sealer, right? Like we pop the deck lid and we look, we pull the carpet back and we look at the floor to the rear body and we see that the seam sealer is spread, is moved. Um, now that, just like I said, these visual indicators don't really tell us what the car needs to be repaired, right? But what does it tell us? That we must look deeper, right? If you pop the deck lid and the car's hit in the rear and it's, you know, bumper rear body, type of job and you see that, that tells you something moved, right? The, the seam sealer didn't crack um, from the factory, right? So something moved it and all that really tells us is we gotta figure out why and where did it move. And it, all these, the gaps, the buckles and the roofs, the crack seam, crack seam sealer, it just tells us that we need to look a little bit deeper, right? And try to figure out what's going on. So. When we're comparing visual damage, we compare it side to side, right? Just like I said, we'll get, you know, we'll do that thing, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Still, our eyes are still a good indicator. It's not going to tell us, by the way, how to fix the car again, but it is going to tell us that, hey, we've got to address this issue right here, right? Use a tape measure, hell, if that's all you got. How about the hand method for suspension? Anybody know what the hand method is for suspension? No? I think that's the way it will. There's an old guy right there. 
<laughs> that. If you're lazy though, like Phil really is, and me too, it's really not the hand method, it's the foot method, right? So you go up to the fender and you stick your foot behind the, the tire and where the fender uh, you know, hits the rocker and you can tell whether or not the wheel is back. If you go back on both sides, if your foot won't fit on one side, that wheel's back, right? You're laughing because you've done it before, yeah. right? So but what does that tell you, right? I mean, you have a pretty good idea that it probably needs a lower arm at that point, depending on how it is. But what it really tells you is, is we need to get this damn thing up in the air and figure out what's fit, right? So that little foot method, it may be funny or laughable, right, Phil? Or your hand, if you really do get down on your knees, which I find hard to believe. But let's just say you did. And you go down there and you check it. All that tells Phil is, is man, I need to get this damn car up in the air and figure out what's driven back on the suspension. Yep. Yep. Okay? So that's what the hand method is, or again, the foot method. Um, no one uses the jounce method anymore. The jounce method, just so you know, by the way, is you get the car bouncing up and down, and if the steering wheel starts shaking like this when you're doing it, it's supposed to indicate that you have a bench strap. On an older car, that's still the case. I'm not so sure you can really make that plain for a newer car. Um, use a tram gauge or uh, uh, or some kind of measuring system for structure damage, right? I'll touch on, I'm going to touch on the measuring a little bit more. Measuring, that Phil will tell you, is pretty near and dear to my heart, and it doesn't get done enough in this industry, so I, am, I will beat this up a little bit over that. Um, commonly missed indirect damage is seat belts, right? Um, you know, you really, really need to look up the OEM procedure on what they say about their seat belts. Most seat belts, by the way, are not supposed to ever be reused again, just so you know. So when the car, if someone's in a chair, and this is why we've got to ask people where were their butts in chairs and what seat belts were in use, right? Because most car makers have put it in writing now that if we've got four people in that car, right, and we've got all you know four seat belts, left rear, right rear, and the, all of those seat belts have to be replaced, right? You can't just leave them in there. The, the, the nylon that they're made out of stretches, and once it does that one time, it will not react properly in the second rep. So here's the thing. What's important on seat belts is, is that you look it up right and don't don't just decide on your own that ah the seat belt looks okay i think it'll be fine that's not a that's not a good approach anymore right so we used a very old picture here but and i don't even know that gm does this anymore but if y'all have has everybody ever seen a gm seat belt where you've pulled it up and this tag is showing you know what that means the seat belt should have been replaced of course, none of us knew that. I mean, I'll be honest with you. GM never, there was no GM people to talk to, right? Or Honda people or Toyota people. But now, just so you know, and these, these cars are, were in the 90s and early 2000s, but you're not supposed to be able to see this tag. So if you can see that tag on a GM seat belt, that means that seat belt's been in use and stretched, and it's no longer going to do its job, just so you know. Again, y'all would have to tell me uh, maybe if on the newer GM cars, if they still are putting that tag on there or not. I don't know if anybody can verify or not. Um, but again, the message here is, is don't think that you know, make sure you look it up, see what Nissan says, right? Don't, don't, don't try to be an engineer. Uh, the steering column and the steering wheel, another commonly missed things. A lot of times, even today, right? People put the death grip on their steering wheel, and when they have a wreck, it bends it, right? And it gets missed, you know, because it's just not something we're really looking for. It doesn't set a light, um, and so sometimes you won't notice that until the very, very end, right? And that's a that part's the kind of part that they always have in stock at the parts, the parts, right? The steering wheels to the color of the car. They're usually sitting there on in stock on a Friday at two when you realize it's been right. How about seat frames and recliners? They get missed a lot. I mean, I can verify, I can tell you, and I feel bad saying this out loud, but I can't tell you how many freaking recliners we missed on little Honda Civics at the Honda dealer I ran a decade ago. And I can tell you, and, and, I, and I feel bad about it now, but those cars would hit the ready line, right? And then all of a sudden, 
probably my estimator finally QC the damn thing because we didn't have a good QC process in place where we were checking and this went through. And he gets out there and looks at it, he's like, boss, I think this damn recliner is bad. And you know, of course, what you do, you pull them all, like you put them in the same spot and you get them up and you look at it, right? Like, shit, it is bad. Now what do we do? Put your knee on it. <laughs> Which, by the way, is a horrible thing to do, but that's what I used to do. So just so y'all, you know, you get your ass in the back chair, you get both your feet up, one on each side, and I have Ed sitting there, I'm like, all right, do I got it there yet? And I just keep pushing and tweaking with my feet until I get there, you're like, you got it. Now what's the problem with that? Then I delivered that car, by the way, to people, to humans. Liability now. Yeah, well the seat's not going to hold up in the next rep. So I literally put people's lives and, you know, and if you're doing that, you're doing the same thing. Just do not ever bend the seat frame back into place like I did 10, 12, 15. And y'all did too, so I know that. Right? How was your back? Huh? How was your back? My back? Dude, you can bend a Honda seat frame like a 12 year old girl can bend a Honda seat frame. You know, I mean, there's nothing to it, right? Just put your feet on it and push it. You can bend it any which way you want. It's like an aluminum can back there. You know? They're easy to move. And that's the thing is 